Here is my story. Jenna, my wife, had been getting more and more verbally abusive these last six or seven months. I didn't know what was going on. Her snide remarks were biting, to say the least. I was starting to avoid her as much as I was able to without making it worse. I started staying at the car lot longer and longer every day. Sometimes even getting home after Jenna and Carrie, our 13-year-old daughter, had already eaten supper. I would have to fend for myself. Sometimes there were leftovers. Lately, however, I think they ended up in the trash before I got home. My name is Kurt Kaminsky. Technically, my name is David Kurt Kaminsky, but my father's name is David also, so they started calling me Kurt early on, so there was no confusion. No, I'm not a junior. My dad's name is David John Kaminsky. Why he didn't just make me a juror is beyond me. I would have been glad to go by juror or even DJ, but no, I would either go by Kurt or DK, and DK just didn't sound right. Yes, I'm Polish. Well, actually, I'm an American of Polish descent. Yes, I've heard all the jokes. Well, probably not all of them. They seem to make up new ones every year. I've heard the relatively innocuous ones like, Do you know why Polacks spell their name with ski at the end? Because they don't know how to spell toboggan. And of course, I've heard worse that I won't repeat here. Being the only person of Polish descent that I know, other than my dad, living in this small town of about 10,000 people made me the target of a lot of those jokes. Technically, I'm only half Polish, the other half, my mom's side, is German, French, Irish, and English all mixed into one. But since my last name is Kaminsky, I am Polish. But I digress, getting back to the issue at hand. My wife, soon to be my estranged wife, is not who I believed her to be. I learned this a mere four weeks ago. As I've said before, I was spending more and more time away from my wife due to her abusive attitude. After coming home to no supper on a number of occasions, I had decided one Monday night to grab a meal at a local restaurant. I was in a booth just about ready to order when I overheard two guys talking in the booth on the other side of the partition. What caught my ear was the phrase that included the word Polak in it. I listened closer and heard one of the men say, So you've been screwing the Polak's wife for how long? I didn't recognize the first guy's voice, but the second I recognized. It was my best friend, George Carey. I sat there stunned. I know they continued talking, but I didn't really hear anything else until I heard George say, Yeah, we get together at least twice a month. Kurt is so busy at the car lot that he doesn't even know what's happening. Again, clueless. Just then, the waitress came by to take my order, and I said softly, Sorry, I've got to go. I left, heading away from their booth so they wouldn't see me. I couldn't believe it. My wife Jenna with my best friend. He had even been my best man at my wedding. He is also my mechanic. Well, he will be for only a little while longer. He is not actually my mechanic, because officially he is an independent contractor that I use exclusively to do all my repairs and inspections of all my cars. If you haven't guessed it yet, I own a used car lot. Yes, I am a used car salesman. I've heard all those jokes and insults also. My business, however, is very good. People know they will get a great car, at a good price. They also know I stand behind my cars. If there are problems, I take care of them. George has always been good mechanically, and I keep him busy and pay him well. I wanted to hire him, but he said he wouldn't respect himself if he had a Polak for a boss. He said it jokingly, but I knew he meant it. In spite of that, I hired him as my independent contractor mechanic. He wasn't very independent, though. In fact, I was his only source of income. That fact would prove to be his downfall. I left the restaurant and drove around. Could this be true? I asked myself, or was he just blowing smoke? I could hire a PI, but if what he said was true, they only got together about twice a month. That could be a big waste of money. What I could do, however, is check her phone and emails. That is what I decided to do. I went home and Jenna was her usual ill-tempered self. That was okay with me. I didn't want to talk to her until I found out the truth anyways. After she went to sleep on her side of the bed, I got up and checked her email. There was nothing there that looked suspicious. Her phone was password protected, but it didn't take me long to determine that our daughter's birth date was the code.
I saw a few texts that could be taken the wrong way, if I was so inclined, but none to or from George. His name was in her contact list, but again, he was my best friend, so that wasn't too unusual. Maybe he was just talking, I thought. However, her attitude lately really got me thinking that there had to be something going on with her. Maybe not with George, but maybe with someone else. I went to bed and tossed and turned, trying to get to sleep. It came sometime after 2.43 a.m., because that was the time that was on the clock the last time I remember looking. The next day, at the car lot, George came in and made some polished joke. This was not uncommon for him. I usually just laughed a slight laugh and then let it die. Today, however, I lit into him. George, what do you even know about Poland? I bet if I laid out a map of the world, you couldn't even point to it. You make jokes, like all Polacks are dumb, but I bet they could point out the U.S. on a map and maybe even our state. Why don't you just get to work? George looked at me and didn't know what to say. He knew I was right. He couldn't point to Poland if his life depended on it. George was never one of the book smart people. He was good looking, had street smarts, and knew his way around an engine, but he was never college material. I guess that's why he hung around with me in high school. I helped him with his homework so he could at least graduate. Now I was beginning to rethink my choice of friends. He was making me rethink my choice in a wife. I went into my office, closed the door, and stewed, thinking of how I could get proof of what may be going on. I couldn't confront either of them. They would just deny it. I needed proof. I called a private investigator in Santa Fe. I told him of my concerns. He said, with it happening only about twice a month, it would be too expensive to tail them. You could put a tracker on your wife's phone. At least you'd know where her phone is whenever you checked. You could also set up cameras in your home but unless you buy the really good ones, and by good I mean expensive, they'd probably be found. Even with the expensive ones, unless your wife is unaware of her surroundings, she would probably notice something different. I guess if I were you, I'd put a tracker on her phone and hope to catch them in a motel or something. I got his recommendation for the tracking software and told him I'd be sending him a check for all his help. I haven't done anything, you owe me nothing. He said, all the information I gave you could have been obtained off the internet. Well, I called you for your expertise and you supplied me with good information, so expect a check in the mail. If you're ever in Silver City, stop by Kaminsky's car lot and say, hi. I typically don't get down to that part of the state, but if I do, I'll look you up. He said, and I could tell he meant it. Part of why I was successful at selling cars was because I made people feel appreciated. I learned early in life that people need to feel that who they are and what they do matters. I looked up the tracking software and decided that I could do at least that. Then I looked up at the camera and felt he had been right. He saved me money, time, and the embarrassment of getting cameras that I had no doubt Jenna would notice. That night, after everyone was in bed, I got up and downloaded the tracking app to her phone and synced it with my phone. It would run in the background without her knowledge. I slept easier that night. That next day at work, I checked the app periodically. She was at her part-time job at the university bookstore. She only worked about 15 to 20 hours a week. She called the money she got her mad money, and she spent it on whatever she wanted, usually going to the salon. Later I checked it, and she was at the grocery store. Then later she was at home. George was in and out most of the day, but when Jen was home, he was at work, so at least that day, I was confident nothing had gone on. That night I decided to try and act nicer to my wife and daughter. My wife seemed to respond a little better when I asked if they wanted to go out to eat at Revel Restaurant. Carrie, however, was her typical 13-year-old self, not sure if she wanted to be seen with her parents. I insisted, and she begrudgingly made her way to the car. Dinner was nice. I made a point of mentioning George in conversation, and Jenna got a faraway look in her eyes, but quickly changed the conversation when she saw me looking at her that increased my suspicions. I wish I knew if what George had been saying was true. I needed some way to figure it out. I didn't bother checking her phone that night. I hadn't had any luck with checking her phone calls or texts, so either she was deleting them right away or wasn't making them in the first place. As I got in bed, I told Jenna, thanks for going out to dinner tonight. Thank you, Kurt. 
that was a pleasant surprise. She looked at me and gave me that look that said, you might get lucky tonight. It had been a while, again, like I said, we hadn't been getting along very well lately. Jenna finished her nightly prep in the bathroom and came to bed, snuggling up next to me. I had mixed emotions about possibly having sex with her. If she had been cheating on me, did I want to? I decided that until I had proof, I would let her initiate and reciprocate at that point. I would not take the lead in this. We did end up having sex, but it was very vanilla, not worth going into any detail about. Oh well, at least I got my rocks off. The rest of the week I kept checking her phone location and continued to see nothing out of the ordinary. On Saturday night, after she was asleep, I checked her phone for texts or phone calls and again found nothing. I was just about to a point where I had convinced myself that George was lying through his teeth, trying to impress some guy about his sexual exploits. It wouldn't be the first time, I knew that for a fact from high school. I went back to bed and tossed and turned again. My subconscious was not letting me get to sleep. It was 2 a.m. and I was lying there staring at the ceiling, unable to get to sleep, so I got up and went downstairs to grab something to drink. Hopefully that would help me fall asleep. I was sitting there, a tumbler glass of Jack Daniels and Coke in one hand and her phone in the other. I decided to check her phone again. I punched in the password, my daughter's birth date, and opened the phone up to her homepage. Then it hit me like a ton of bricks. Our daughter's birth date was the key. Our daughter's pregnancy was a tough one. In fact, we thought we were going to lose her several times throughout the pregnancy. Something about her worry not being compatible with my wife's. It was like my wife's body was fighting the child within her. In fact, my wife was on bed rest the last three weeks of her pregnancy so that she could carry the baby to full term. She did carry her to term. In fact, exactly nine months to the day of our wedding, Carrie came into this world. We were so happy. She was healthy, but she was a difficult baby, crying all the time, not taking to a regular nap schedule, not wanting to take to Jenna's breast, you name it, she was a struggle. My wife, in Carrie's second year, told me in no uncertain terms that we will not be having another one. That depressed me, but to be honest, the baby was sucking all the joy out of our lives. I mentioned that nine months to the day she was born. They call those babies wedding night babies because they are conceived that night or on the honeymoon. A light went on in my head. If what George said was true, then there was a good possibility that Jenna was already pregnant before we even had our wedding night. Jenna had been on the pill. No, we hadn't waited until we were married to have sex. In fact, it was a large part of our time together. The doctor, when asked how Jenna got pregnant, said that the stress of the wedding had probably affected her hormones and made the pill ineffective. Well, if it was ineffective that night, it was also ineffective that day. I now knew what I had to do. There was a 50% chance that I was not the father. You know the expression, the early bird gets the worm. Well, George might have been the early bird. I think, however, in his case, the expression should be, the early worm gets the bird. I got out of bed and went into the bathroom. I found the Q-tips and went into Carrie's room. She was a sound sleeper now. She had finally taken to a good sleep pattern when she was four years old. Up until then, it was rough going. She was lying there snoring, with her mouth wide open. It was easy for me to take the Q-tip and swab the inside of her cheek. She didn't even wake up. I put this in a plastic Ziploc bag and repeated the process for myself. If it turned out that Carrie was my biological daughter, it would still leave me with questions as to Jenna's fidelity. If, however, Carrie was not mine, genetically, then things would hit the fan. Sunday was a work around the house day, and we all had our own chores to do. I took my time with them to limit my exposure to either Jenna or Carrie. I had a hard time keeping my emotions in check, so I didn't want to give anything away. I was anxious, yet hesitant, to find out the results of my suspicions. This weighed heavily on my mind all day. Jenna asked me, is something bothering you, Kurt? I had to think up something quickly, so I said. I'm looking to buy a large number of cars at the next auction so I can fill up my lot. That will mean money will be tight until I can make some sales to offset it. Well, don't overextend us, she stated.
She always said us when talking about the business, which I guess was good that she felt it was ours, but in reality, when I had opened the car lot I had incorporated so as to limit my liability. We live in a litigious society, and I didn't want something done at the business to adversely affect my personal life. I think I'm going to pay off the credit cards and cancel all but one so that our credit worthiness looks that much better. I told her, this was a ruse to explain my plans to waylay any potential for her to screw me financially if and when she found out my plans. Whatever you think you need to do, she said nonchalantly. That idea had come to me in the spur of the moment. It is amazing how your mind can work if you let it. That would limit any potential fallout if what I expected was true. So, bright and early Monday morning, I took my samples to the West New Mexico University and spoke with someone in the science department. They directed me to the department head. He told me that they have a cellular and molecular biology major program and that they would be happy to do it. I gave him a few of my business cards and told him that he or anyone that worked on the samples would get 10% off their purchase. He seemed to appreciate that, saying, I have been thinking of trading my Camry in on a newer car. I might just have to swing by and check out your selection. If you don't see anything you like, just let me know, and I'll work with you to get you something you do like. I told him. Thank you, I'll do that, he replied. I know I was smiling as I drove out of the university, but it was a worried smile. The results might be the end of my marriage. When I had told Jen about buying more cars to fill up my lot, it was just to cover my worried expression. Now I thought, that's not a bad idea. I called Paul, my bookkeeper, loan officer, and part-time salesman, into my office and told him my idea. We can make it work, he said. Paul, I'd like to do something else also. I'd like to pay off my mortgage on my house. Can we work out a one-time payment to me so that I can accomplish that? Let me take a closer look at the financials and get back with you this afternoon. As he walked out of my office, I thought about calling my lawyer and asking for a referral to a family lawyer. I then thought, you might be jumping the gun, let's see what the results are first. After all, I hadn't found any proof yet of my wife having an affair. That afternoon, Paul showed me the spreadsheet and we discussed going forward with both of my plans. The next two days were some of the longest. I was on pins and needles waiting for the results of the DNA tests. Late Wednesday afternoon, I got a call from the department head. He was on his way over with the results and to look at a car. When he arrived, I directed him right into my office. He looked at me and the expression on his face told me what the results were. Then he spoke up and confirmed it. The two samples collected are not related. I nodded my head and he could tell that, although I expected it, I was devastated by the news. He gave me a minute to process it and slid the manila envelope over with the results. I looked up at him, my expression changed, and I said, So, what kind of car were you thinking about? Well, I know this is going to sound cliche, but I just turned 50 and I'm looking for a sports car. I was thinking of a Mazda Miata. I told him that I didn't have one on my lot, but I was going to an auction the next day and would make a point of finding one that was both mechanically and cosmetically sound. I would call him the following afternoon to let him know what I had found. As he left, I told Anna, my receptionist slash scheduler slash office manager slash part-time salesperson, that I will be leaving early, but if you need me, I will only be a phone call away. I knew she wouldn't call, she rarely needed me. She could handle almost everything that needed to be done. I drove around the town, just looking. It's strange, but things looked different to me. I called my lawyer, he was sad about the news, but referred me to another lawyer that he knew would do me right. I called and made an appointment for late the following afternoon. I grabbed a meal at a restaurant and thought while I ate. Had I wasted the last 15 years of my life? I couldn't even say I had at least had a child from the marriage. Sure, I still thought of her, in some way, as my kid, but biologically she was not. What would I do going forward? I knew that I couldn't just act like I knew nothing. Sure, I had been clueless before, but now that I knew, there was no going back. I knew one thing for sure, George was going to pay. I didn't care if he had been my best friend for years. With friends like him, I could use more enemies. Jenna was going to pay also. 
I wonder if she knew Carrie wasn't mine. Even if she didn't, she had hidden this secret from me, the secret of her wedding day with my best man, my best friend. Now I had no reason to not believe what I had overheard. She was screwing him at least twice a month. I was beginning to become enraged, and before I got out of control, I needed to be alone, away from everyone. I needed to call Jenna and tell her I would not be home that night. I couldn't go home, I would likely do something that would put me in jail. She answered the phone, Hey Kurt. Hey, I'm going to spend the night in Albuquerque, so I can be ready for the auction at 8 o'clock. I said in an emotionless tone. Oh, uh, okay, have a safe trip, she said. I normally don't go all the way to Albuquerque for an auction, so this was unusual. I wondered if she would take advantage of my being gone all night. She'd have to pawn Carrie off on my parents, and that would be hard to explain. I would, however, be taking periodic looks at her phone tracker throughout the evening just to see if she chose to go anywhere. I traveled the roads up to Albuquerque. I would be looking to buy at least 20 cars, including a Mazda Miata. I would arrange for them to either be picked up or shipped back to my lot once the auction was done. The question running through my mind now was, who would I have go over them mechanically? I knew that George would not be getting any more work from me once his scheduled car reviews and repairs were done. When he hears about my buying two dozen cars, there will be dollar signs in his eyes with how much he would be able to charge me to do all that work. That, however, would not happen, and I'd keep that a secret until the last minute. I would need to speak to one of the local dealers at the auction to see who would be good enough, and trustworthy enough to look them over before they were shipped down to our little town. I made it to Albuquerque at about 9 o'clock and grabbed a room at a Best Western. Even though I was the owner, I couldn't justify a high-priced hotel being charged to the company accounts. The room was comfortable, as well as the bed. That is all I needed. I'm a simple man with simple needs. I took a moment to check Jenna's phone tracker when I got in. I found that she was still at home, or at least her phone was. Sleep came hard that night. I kept going over in my mind why she would do what she has done. How could she justify screwing him on our wedding day, let alone about twice a month for who knows how long? I started reviewing our marriage. It was never perfect, whose is, but I thought we loved each other, exclusively. Now I knew that was a misconception on my part, right from the start. Things were rough those first few years after we got married. We surely didn't expect a child right away. The initial plan was to wait three or four years, and then start our family. Three kids were what we had agreed on before we got married. The struggles with Carrie, however, destroyed those plans. To learn that those plans were destroyed by my best friend made all the struggles seem like wasted effort. Fourteen years of wasted effort. Oh, sure there were good times, but even those now were tainted by this news and the probability that they may have been screwing all along throughout our marriage. If Jenna wouldn't have slept with George, maybe I would have gotten her pregnant, and maybe she wouldn't have had such a bad pregnancy and a difficult baby, causing her to not want any more. George had messed up my life when he screwed my soon-to-be wife on my wedding day. Now he's screwing her at least twice a month, I'm sure laughing at the clueless Polak all the while. He's going to have to pay. I thought to myself as I lay there trying to sleep. I was enraged again. I had to calm down or I wouldn't be able to get to sleep. I turned on the TV to some mindless comedy show. The laughing helped to calm me down. By 11 o'clock, I was ready to go to sleep in anticipation of a long day ahead of me. The auction went great. I got some great cars at great prices and met some of the dealers from around the Albuquerque area. I didn't see a Miata at the auction, so I started asking some of the other dealers. Two of them had one, one red, and one black. I asked them if they would be willing to work a trade when I found out what color my client preferred. Of course, they each said, just let me know what kind of cards you have on your lot and we'll make it happen. I needed to make a point of coming to this auction more often. The camaraderie with the other businessmen and women in the same type of business was getting me excited to expand my business. It had also taken my mind off of my problems. That afternoon, when I met with the lawyer, the news was not good. I would lose half of everything and still have to pay a lemony and child support. Child support for a child that was not even mine.
I decided then and there that I would not get divorced. Instead, I would leave her with George's child. I would pay off the mortgage on the house. She could stay in it, but my name was the only one on the deed, so she wouldn't be able to sell it. If I left, it kept paying the taxes and utilities. She couldn't file under abandonment and take the house. I did have to figure out what to do with my business, though. It was set up as a corporation, but somehow, I knew if I didn't do something to protect it, I could lose it. I would need to talk to my business lawyer about that. When I walked in the door of my house, I was exhausted from a long day, so I told Jenna, I'm beat. I'm going to take a shower and go right to bed. And I walked up to the bedroom. Do you want dinner? She called to me. No, I had a late lunch, I replied. At least she thought to ask. The shower felt great. My problems seemed to almost melt away. I had problems, but I was on the road to addressing them. I was asleep in minutes after my hand hit the pillow. I had been stressing for the last week, and now that I had started to formulate a plan of action, my mind could rest. I woke up early, refreshed, and headed into the office before Jenna or Carrie were even awake. I had things to do and more plans to make. As my employees started arriving, they found me knee-deep in spreadsheets, financials, and sales projections. I told Paul that I had purchased 23 vehicles, and that we would be doing a trade within the week for a vehicle from a dealer in Albuquerque. I told Anna not to schedule any more work for George, but to keep that confidential. She looked at me with a puzzled look on her face and said, You're the boss. Thanks, Anna. You're indispensable. When 9 o'clock rolled around, I called my business lawyer and picked his brain about what I should do. Well, your business is incorporated, but there may still be a way that she could force you to sell it to get half its value. Have you thought of selling it beforehand? No, would I need to? It would keep the business out of her hands, he said. This business is my life. I couldn't get rid of it, I told him. Well, let me do some thinking and research. I'll call you later in the week. That news was devastating. I worked hard building my business into what it is today. It's my baby, unlike Carrie. I thought to myself. Now I was getting enraged again. Part of being a good business person is the ability to compartmentalize and multitask. I needed to put my personal problems aside and get back to business. The first thing on my list was to call Doug, the department head that had determined that what George had said was true. Doug, Kurt Kaminsky. Hey, I got a line on two myatas that might interest you. One is red and the other is black. Are you still considering it? I am if the price is right. He said, Which color would you be interested in? I'll get it here so you can look at it, then we'll talk numbers. Even if we can't come to an agreement on price, I'm sure I can sell it without too much trouble. Which one would you suggest? He asked. There are pluses and minuses with each. Fire engine red is a great eye-catching color, but red fades faster. Black is sleek looking, but it gets hot quickly in our climate. Let me ask you, will this car be kept in a garage when you're not using it? Yes, I can do that. Then the red one won't see much sun, so fading won't be an issue. I go with that unless you feel black is more your style. Red sounds great. How soon can I see it? Monday or Tuesday work for you? Sure, call me when you get it in. Will do. I hung up and called the dealer that had the red one to arrange a swap. He was interested in a BMW on my lot. It had been sitting there for three months. He would have a better chance of selling it in the big city. By this time, George had come in. He had a couple of cars that still needed to have work done. Being an independent contractor, he could come and go as he pleased. As long as the work was done when I needed the car, I was fine with that. He overheard a couple of the salespeople talking about the 23 cars soon to be on our lot. He popped his head into my office and said, Hey Kurt, when are those cars coming in from the auction? I want to make sure I set my schedule up to get those done for you. The auction house is arranging for them to be shipped down here. It will be sometime late next week or early the following week. I told him. It was hard for me to speak calmly to him, the backstabber. Okay, I'll get with Anna and have her get me on the schedule, he said. I just chuckled to myself as he left. That weekend I tried to stay at a distance from Jenna. 
I did yard work and ran a lot of errands. I didn't even bother checking her phone tracker. It really made no difference to me anymore. I felt only contempt for her. Having me raise someone else's child was beyond forgivable. Monday, I was back at the car lot. I called the dealer in Albuquerque and told him I'd be driving the Beamer up and picking up the Miata. He said, great, we'll have a late lunch when you get here. It was a nice day for a drive, so I let Anna know I would be gone the whole day. Hold down the fort, I told her. We'll do, boss, she replied. She truly was indispensable. I need to give her a raise, I said to myself. The drive was nice, along with the lunch. The other owner really made me feel welcome, and I felt like I had a new friend. On the way back, driving the Miata, I was really enjoying myself. The top was down and the wind was blowing through my hair. I decided that I would call the other dealer and get the black one for me. I needed to live a little and I would have no need for more than a two-seater shortly. I drove into our driveway with the red sports car. Jenna looked out the window and must have said something to Carrie because they both came out to see it. Honey, why do you have this car? You know we need something with a back seat for Carrie, she said in a condescending way. Just picked it up from Albuquerque for a customer. I thought you each might like a ride in it, I replied. No, honey, I don't like small cars, Jenna said with a little disdain in her voice. Carrie, I said, motioning to my daughter to get in. No, Dad, it's bad enough having to be teased about my last name. I don't want to be seen riding around with Polak, the used car salesman, she said in a way only a teenager can say it. I was taken aback, to say the least. Where did this disrespect come from? I looked at Jenna, and she acted like Carrie had done nothing wrong. Great, now I have both women in my household disrespecting me. I know teenagers aren't supposed to be best buds with their parents, but the hurtful way she said that made me look at my whole family life as a sham. Well, I'm going to take it for another spin. I'll be back whenever. I said as I put the car in reverse and took off. I drove along the roads through and around Silver City fuming. My marriage was quickly deteriorating. When I finally pulled into the driveway at around 9.30, I went right upstairs, hopped in the shower, and climbed in bed. When I didn't come down after my shower, Jenna came up and walked into the room. The light from the hallway was shining right in my eyes. I squinted them shut. What? Your feelings hurt because we didn't fawn all over the sports car. You're not going to come downstairs and spend time with your family. You're not only a Polak, you're also a baby. Where was this attitude coming from? I had to believe it was coming from George. She's been spending time with him, and his cutdowns of my heritage were rubbing off. Now she's spreading that to her daughter. It was her daughter, not mine. I should probably get that into my head. I would probably have to support her, but she was not my daughter. It appears that you and your daughter would rather not have the Polak around, so you can just screw off. I was pissed, and her attitude wasn't helping her case at all. She would regret ever treating me the way she was. Needless to say, it was quiet and cold in the Kaminsky household from then on. The next day I called Doug, and he came down to check out the Miata. He was thrilled. We talked to numbers, and he was surprised at what a great price he was getting, $3,000 under Kelly Blue Book. As he was about to leave, after filling out all the paperwork, he said, My best friend is in charge of purchasing for the university, and we rotate 16 cars out about every two years. I know it's not much, but would you be willing to talk to him? Always glad for the business, and you know I'll cut them a deal. I said. I'll have Jim call you later this week. Thank you. I said. That is how I had grown my business, treating people right and letting them know that I appreciated the referrals. On Wednesday, my lawyer called me. Hey, Kurt, I think I have a solution to your potential problem. Could you stop by this afternoon to discuss it with me? Sure, I'm eager to get this going. The atmosphere around my house is getting pretty unbearable. At the meeting that day, I listened and liked the plan. It would take about two weeks to implement it, but if it worked, it would be worth it. Over those two weeks, I slowly removed personal items and any tools out of my house and into an apartment in a nearby town. 
Also, over those two weeks, George was getting anxious to have those two dozen cars come in so he could have some work that he could build me for. When he'd ask, I just put him off. Over that last weekend, I spent the time doing yard work, and when Jenna and Carrie weren't around, I cleaned out my closet and dressers. Jenna did laundry during the week so she could have the weekends to do what she wanted to do. That was good for me because she wouldn't notice my closet being emptied out. So that brings me back to the Monday night that I told Jenna, I'm leaving. She had, again, been giving me attitude and disrespecting me, both for being a Polak and a used car salesman. I amped it up by calling her a loser. She hated that word. That is when she blew her top, and that is when I told her I was leaving. In the past, I would go to a motel for a night, maybe two, depending on how pissed I was. Tuesday morning, after the blow-up, I went into the car lot early, and as my employees were coming in, I asked them to go into the conference room. I shut the door behind them. I had weekly meetings, so this wasn't unusual. I started the meeting. Good morning. As you are all aware, the cars I bought a couple weeks ago came in yesterday afternoon. They have all already been checked out and prepped, so they are ready to be sold as of right now. We are no longer using George to do any work here. If he asks you, tell him that we have decided to go a different direction and leave it at that. You all have been terrific. You're like family, so that is why I'm having a hard time with what is coming next. I paused and wiped a tear from my eye. I have sold the business. They all looked at me, surprise in their eyes. However, nothing will change as far as your jobs are concerned. Well, except Anna, you are going to be taking on some of my duties, and of course getting a raise to coincide. They all, even in their surprised state, started congratulating Anna. They all respected her and knew she deserved it. Anna, after the meeting please come and talk to me, and we'll go over a few things. I will still be involved, however. I will be on a consulting basis, and maybe do an occasional sale. I don't want to take any sales away from any of you. They were all glad that I would still be around, if only sometimes. The meeting broke up, and as we walked out the door, George was standing there. Hey, why wasn't I included in the meeting? Most of the prior meetings he had been included. I spoke up, saying, because this was an employee meeting, and you are not an employee. He stammered a little bit, and then said, I see the cars finally arrived. I'll get started on them right away. No, they have already been thoroughly inspected and prepped for sale. They aren't going to need anything done to them, I said sternly. He looked at me stunned. But I check out all your cars, Kurt. What's going on? George, I've sold the business and the new owner wants to go in a different direction. I told him, not ready to blow up on him. I would save that for another day. I left it at that. I've learned that sometimes fewer words are better. I can't believe you sold the business, he exclaimed. What am I supposed to do now? Of course, it was all about him. He had effectively been told he was out of a job. Well, I said, you can pick up your check for what you've done in the last two weeks. That hadn't been a lot. Anna had only used him a few times. He had been relaxing before the 23-car delivery, thinking he'd be busy once they came in. How wrong he was. I didn't feel sorry for him at all. I only wished that I could tell him it was because he was a backstabbing jerk. As I met with Anna, I asked her if she could keep our conversation confidential. Sure, Kurt, you know I would never say anything you didn't want me to, she assured me. Okay, here is the deal. I have created companies that I incorporated in Nevada. One of the companies is buying this car lot, the other is buying the other company. I am the sole stock owner of both of the companies. I will be divorcing Jenna at some point, and I am ensuring she doesn't get the business. Why? she asked. I have moved out of my house. Jenna doesn't know it yet, but I'm not going back. She has been having an affair with George. In fact, Carrie is not my daughter. I believe she is George's. I don't even know if Jenna knows, let alone George. They will find out soon enough, though. I am not pursuing a divorce, but rather will continue to pay the utilities and taxes on our house. That way she won't be able to say I abandoned her and take everything I own. Just in case she files for divorce for irreconcilable differences, I don't want her to be able to take the business. That is why I have arranged for the company to be purchased twice. Let them try to figure out what's going on.
The proceeds of the sale will be used up by the time she gets around to actually getting a divorce finalized. Also, I will be making next to nothing in consulting and a few sales commissions. Anna, you are fully capable of handling the day-to-day -day operations. I will be available to call if you have a question, but let me tell you, I trust you and trust your judgment. A smile had returned to her face when I had explained the new ownership, but when she heard about Jenna and George, she looked like she was ready to shoot someone. This was a woman that I truly admired and respected. I continued, I have one more task for you to do, then I will get out of your hair. I need you to order a new sign and letterhead. We are changing the name of the business. That will further set in George and Jenna's minds that the business has been sold to someone else. The new business name will be Bizradney Auto. I spelled the name out for her so I knew she had it right. She looked at me with a quizzical look on her face. I said, Someday, I'll tell you why I picked that name. Suffice it to say that it tells the whole story. She still looked puzzled, but trusted me enough to follow my instructions. With that I left, saying a few words to everyone as I walked out. I hopped in my car, an Audi, and headed up the road toward Albuquerque. I was about two hours into my drive when I got a phone call. Caller ID told me it was Jenna. I hadn't expected her to call until this evening. That had been the way it had been many times before when I had left. I would be gone for a day or two, she would call. We'd talk, and I'd come back. Things would change for a while, and then we'd get back to our old selves again. Sometime later, we'd have another blow-up, and the cycle would start all over again. I decided to answer the call, waiting to hear what BS she had to spew this time. Hello, I said through the car's hands-free mic. Kurt, what's going on? She said, somewhat tentatively. Nothing, just driving to Albuquerque. Why are you driving there? She asked. To pick up a car, I said with no emotion. So, what I heard must be wrong then, she said. So, George must have called her. Figures, call your lover to find out what's going on with her husband. I don't know, I said. What have you heard? George called me and said you sold the business. Why would he call you? I asked, putting her on the spot. She recovered well. He's your best friend. He wondered if I knew what was going on. Best friend? What a joke. I was a joke to him. Stupid Polak is helpless and clueless to see what is going on behind his back with his wife. I said to Jenna, it appears that my family was embarrassed that I was a used car salesman, so yes, I sold the business. Now you don't have to wear that stigma anymore. Uh, shouldn't we have talked about that first? She said. I'm sure she was worried about how we were going to afford to live now. It's my company. I owned it before we were married. I can sell it whenever I want. I just hope the new owner treats my former employees right. So, did you get a good price for it? Again, she was worried about how this would affect her standard of living. I wasn't concerned with that. I just knew that I needed to change my job. I'll start looking around after I take a few weeks off to relax. What about the mortgage? She asked. Oh, I used the proceeds to pay off the house. You don't need to worry about that. We just need to pay the utilities and the taxes now. What about food? What about gas? What about insurance? She said, almost in hysterics. Oh, I guess I am a stupid Polak. I didn't even think about them. Do you think you could take on more hours at your job? She was flustered now. When are you coming home? Here it was, the moment of truth. I'm not, I said in a matter-of-fact way. What? I told you the other night that I was leaving. You told me not to come back, so I'm not. Don't worry, I'll find a way to pay all the utilities so the lights won't get turned off. You can't do that, Kurt. You have to come back. I could hear the desperation in her voice. No, I really don't. I said in a deadpan voice. Kurt, don't do this, she cried. I already have, I said. What about your daughter, she asked, trying to pull at my heartstrings. You mean Carrie, the girl that is ashamed of her last name, and also that her old man is, or was, a used car salesman. Kurt, she's just being a 13-year-old girl. He can't take that personally. Well, it really doesn't matter anymore. I won't be coming back so neither one of you will be embarrassed by me. With that I hung up and turned my phone off. Let her stew on that. 
I knew right now she was trying to call me back and would get irate that I wasn't picking up. I calmed down from my phone call and tried to enjoy the leisurely drive up to Albuquerque. I could only assume that her next call was to her lover to try to get more information and to let him know what I had said. When I had gotten to my destination, I turned my phone back on and saw that I had five messages. I listened to them all, three from Jenna, one from George, and one from Anna. I called Anna right away. Hey Anna, sorry, I had my phone turned off. I was getting unwanted calls. Yeah, I know. Your wife and George have been calling me to find out where you're at. I told them that you don't own the place anymore, so you don't check in anymore. I hope that was all right. Perfect. I said. If they give you too much trouble, tell them you're calling the cops about harassing phone calls. I like that, she said. Kurt, you may feel like you don't have a family or friends anymore, but believe me, you do. We are your family, always will be. Thank you, Anna. You knew just what to say. I hope your husband knows how lucky he is. Believe me, he knows. He tells me all the time. Don't ever lose that. Don't ever take each other for granted. Don't intend to, she said. I hung up and thought about whether I should call my cheating wife or the backstabbing loser. No, let them stew. I got out of the Audi and walked into the car lot office. The owner was there waiting for me. I've got that Audi I told you about. Do you want to see if we can make a trade? Let's take a look, he said. He was impressed by the condition of the vehicle, both inside and out, as well as under the hood. He looked at me and said, I could sell this in a week. Are you sure you want to do the trade? I think I'm getting the better end of the deal. You can reciprocate sometime in the future. I'm not here to make a buck. I'm here to get a sports car. A half hour later, I was back on the road, with the top down, enjoying the ride. Now I just needed to decide where to go. North sounded good, so I headed to Santa Fe. For the next two weeks, I traveled throughout North New Mexico, Arizona, Southern Utah, and Colorado. I wanted to be close in case Anna needed me to come back. I called her a couple times, and when it was evident she had it handled, I decided to venture west. Of course, I kept getting phone calls. At first, they had an annoyed tone, then an apologetic tone, and finally, an all-out pout tone. I listened, but didn't care. When I got the call about the credit card having been cancelled, I just laughed. When George called and told me I was a terrible person to just run out on Jenna and Carrie, I had to laugh even more. I did get one phone call from my lawyer. Jenna had called and was threatening to file for abandonment if I didn't get a hold of her and come back. I called him back. Hey, it's Kurt. So, you've been getting threatening phone calls from my wife, I said. Yeah, I wouldn't sweat it, though. If you're still paying the utilities on the house, she will have a hard time proving that. I can do you one better. I said, I've got a recording of me telling her I'm leaving and her telling me to not come back. That's awesome. Send me a copy of that, he said. If she gives me any trouble, I'll give that to her lawyer. Let her lawyer try to force the issue. Thanks, I'll call you in a week to see what's going on. I traveled all over the Southwest. The Miata wasn't the most comfortable ride, but it sure was fun. I got a lot of looks from a lot of people, even some flashes from some bored middle-aged women. I didn't pursue that though, I was still married after all, for what it's worth. I traveled to Reno, and then Lake Tahoe, out to the coast, into Napa Valley, and down Highway 1, zigging and zagging along the shoreline. I cut over to Yosemite, and then down to San Diego, across through Death Valley, and to Vegas, and then to Phoenix. Through all of this, I took my time. I would stop at car lots and talk to the owners and just talk. Some of them were envious that a guy in his late 30s could just take off and travel around. After about three months and 8,000 miles, I decided to head back to Silver City. I pulled into Bizrati Auto and was met by my whole team. In fact, there were a few new faces. They all welcomed me back. As I walked into Anna's office, formerly my office, she looked up. When she saw me, her smile grew huge, and she got up, came around her desk, and gave me a huge hug. We talked for a while, and then I asked, Do you think I could take everyone over to Wrangler's to have a meal and drinks? Could you close up shop at five o'clock? 
It was three o'clock at the moment, and I had a few errands to run. Sure, I'll insist on it. The whole crew will be there. I sent goodbye and told them all I'd see them in two hours. They were in good spirits. I visited my lawyer. He had informed me earlier in my travels that Jenna tried to go the abandonment route so she could get all my assets, but he was able to thwart her efforts. We talked about what to do going forward. At five o'clock, I met the crew at Wrangler's. We had a great meal, and it was good to catch up with them all. After about an hour and a half, they started to leave to head home. Finally, it was just Anna and I. She looked at me and said, You know, Kurt, you may think you're helpless, vulnerable, and clueless, but you're wrong. You just trusted the ones you loved. I looked at her, so you figured it out, huh? Yeah, it took me a while, but you had said the new name told the whole story. It kept needling me until I figured it out. You may be the Polak, but all those jokes could never describe the real you. The jokes are an insult to you and your heritage. Thank you, Anna. You are truly the main reason I came back. I had to see how you were filling my shoes. I'm happy to say that you didn't fill my shoes, but rather made a pair of your own. I had a great mentor, she said appreciatively. We hugged and she went home to her husband. He truly was a lucky man. I went back to the apartment that I hadn't been back to in three months. It was stale and needed a good airing out. I opened the windows and let the cool evening air fill the rooms. I grabbed a beer and sat out on the deck overlooking the pool. There were a few people swimming and a family playing. I thought back to Jenna and I. We had such high hopes and dreams when we got married. Now they were all gone. I looked at the clock on the wall. It was about 8.30. I thought to myself, I guess it's about time for the showdown. I got up, jumped into my Miata, and drove to my house. I guess technically, it was still mine. I had bought it before Jenna, and I were married, and my name was the only one on the deed. I was disappointed when I pulled into the driveway. The yard had not been kept up. In fact, it looked like the landscaping hadn't even been touched. The lights were on, so I figured Jenna was home. I walked up to the door and knocked. The door opened a minute later, and Carrie was standing there. Her eyes got big, and she said, Dad. Hello, Carrie. Is your mother home? She stammered and then yelled, Mom. I heard Jenna yell from the kitchen in a stressed-out, shrill voice. What is it now? She kept looking at me and said, loudly in response, Dad. Jenna came around the corner, saw me, and shouted, Where the hell have you been? I decided to answer her shouting with a calm, even voice, traveling. Just then, George came out of the bedroom area in just his boxers. Oh, I said, the whole family is here, mom, dad, and child. What the hell are you talking about? Spit back Jenna. I assume George has moved in to take my place. After all, it is rightfully his. Jenna looked at me with a puzzled expression on her face. Carrie said, he lost his apartment after you fired him, and mom needed a man to help pay the bills and take care of the other duties around here, since you just left. The vitriol in her voice was palpable. Well, young lady, you seem to be misinformed. She hated when I corrected her. George was never my employee at his insistence, so I couldn't have fired him. As for the bills, all the utilities are auto-paid, as well as the car insurance. What about the groceries and gas in the car? Jenna shouted. You had a job. Did you lose it? I know before it was just your mad money, but it was enough to buy groceries and gas while I was gone. So, you think you're going to come back and just move right back in? She asked. No, I'll wait until you and your lover can find a place. It was obvious that they were sleeping together in my house and Carrie seemed to be okay with it. I'm not moving out of my house, Jenna said. For correction, this is my house. It was mine before we got married and my name is the only one on the deed. I replied. Well, you left, so now it's mine. The law doesn't work that way. Since I have been paying the utilities and the taxes, I am still the rightful owner, and although I was gone for a short period of time, I still own it. Don't worry, I'll give you two lovebirds until the end of next month to find a place. Just make sure you take your daughter with you. What do you mean your daughter? She's our daughter. Truer words could not be spoken. I said with a grin on my face. 
Jenna looked puzzled. Then I said to Carrie, Carrie, I know you hate being known as a Polak, so I've got good news for you. I am not your real father, George is. The silence in the room was deafening. After a minute, Jenna said meekly, what? Yes, Jenna, it appears your little wedding day indiscretion resulted in a baby, just not mine. Good news though, Carrie, now you can take your real daddy's last name and be Carrie Carrie. Hum, I wonder if maybe mom didn't insist on the name Carrie as homage to her lover. I looked at Jenna, and she looked at George, he was white as a ghost. What, George, you don't want to be a daddy? Well, too bad. Step up to the responsibility. Look at it this way, though, it's only for about four more years, oh, and then college. Jenna and George said, almost in unison, I don't believe it. I threw the DNA report at them, see for yourself. They grabbed it, looked at it, and then both fainted. Carrie, tell the lovebirds that your mom will be served divorce papers sometime next week along with an eviction notice. I turned and walked away. All the time I had been gone, I wondered if the affair had been going on all through the marriage. In fact, I wondered if she was ever faithful to me. We had met when she came in to buy a car. George was working on a car, and we both thought she would be a great one to date. She chose me, or did she? I truly was bizratity. Clueless, helpless, vulnerable. The whole time George was laughing at me behind my back as well as making polished jokes in front of my face. I drove back to the apartment and grabbed a beer or four. In the morning, I went to my lawyer and had him start the paperwork. Sure, I knew that I would have to sell the house and split the proceeds, but as a barely employed man, I wouldn't be expected to pay alimony or child support, especially with another man already taking my place. Well, that's what I hoped at least. I had loved Jenna and George too. The betrayal was unbelievable. It would take me a long time to trust anyone, either male or female. Maybe I should get counseling. As the divorce process progressed, I went back to work at the car lot, but just as a salesman. I made a point to let all of the staff know that I was no longer the boss and that I only needed one sale a week to pay my rent and buy groceries. In fact, I insisted on only one. When it came to the support required from the court, I wanted to have no money available at the end of the month, besides my own meager living expenses, that is. Jenna got a lawyer. I don't know how she could afford it. Maybe he was doing it on contingency. Boy, was he going to be surprised. They looked at my bank accounts and saw that I had spent the sale proceeds, and they even looked at the sale but didn't find anything improper about it. They didn't dig deep enough. I heard from my fellow salespeople that while I was gone, George had been in almost every day for the first two weeks talking to Anna about getting some work. She had no problem telling him no every time. He finally gave up. He was now regretting that he never got his ASE certification because the only work he could find was at a Valvoline quick oil change, making $13 per hour. I sure hoped Jenna went to full time or else they were going to have a hard time making ends meet. I contacted a realtor and informed Jenna that I was putting the house up for sale in anticipation of splitting all our assets 50 50 -ths. She had already been served the eviction notice, so she would have to be out before the house sold and closed anyways. One night, I got a knock on my door. Of course, it was Jenna. I opened the door. I looked at her and asked, What do you want? Kurt, can we talk? I don't think that is a good idea. We're in litigation against each other. Come on, Kurt. It's just me, no lawyers. Can't we sit down and have a civil conversation? Yeah, I guess, but let's go out to Denny's, I said, so there are witnesses. I thought to myself, I didn't trust her enough to be alone with her. We sat in a booth at Denny's, and after a couple of minutes of pleasantries, I asked, Why, Jenna? She looked at me, hesitated, and said, I guess the easy answer is that I liked both of you and I couldn't make up my mind. So, were you dating both of us at the same time? She looked down at the table and said, Yes but George told me not to say anything to you because he knew it would destroy your personal and working relationship with him. So, when I asked you to marry me, why did you say yes? Because I loved you. What about George? I asked. I loved him too, but I knew he would never be husband material. When you asked me, he and I discussed it, and we quit our relationship. 
I wanted to focus on us and get ready for our wedding. So, on our wedding day, you letting him screw you, you was saying, I'm marrying him, but you're still my man. She started crying. It wasn't like that. So, what was it, Jenna? She hesitated and then said, I didn't want to lose him, and he didn't want to lose me. Well, now you two have each other and your child. Nice job with her name, by the way. I didn't even catch it until I had time to think during the three months on the road. I didn't know Carrie wasn't yours. Really, I didn't. Then she looked at me and said, Kurt, I wanted to come talk to you tonight to tell you that I still love you. That's nice to hear you say, Jenna, but I don't think you know what love is. I love you beyond anything or anyone else. Obviously, you can't say the same thing. I loved you, but I can honestly say that I don't love you anymore. I did with all my heart, but now I only hold you in contempt. When I said that she looked up at me and knew that our relationship was gone, there would never be an us anymore. I had to ask her another question. Did you ever stop? She hesitated and then must have figured it really didn't matter, so she told the truth. We never really stopped. We had lulls, but we would get together usually twice a month. I had hoped for a different answer, but was glad she told me the truth anyways. One more question. What happened about a year ago that made you start to treat me so badly? Your whole attitude started to change. The outward disdain was evident. Her face turned red. Then she looked a little mad. George started to try to get me to do a three-way and not with you. I could probably have done it if you were involved, but we couldn't figure out a way to make that happen. He kept pushing it, though, and it made me resent you for what I know you would never do. I know it sounds odd, but I thought that I could have my two men love me together, and I resented you for not being the kind of person that would allow it. So, did you ever do it? I asked. No, I thought about it but then you left and my whole world came crashing down. Well, now you can do it with the knowledge that I don't care. What you do is no longer of my concern. We both knew that our time to talk had come to an end, so I paid the bill and we walked out to our respective cars. Four months later, we were standing in front of a judge and he pronounced us divorced. George was there too. As we were walking out of the courthouse, Jenna said, can we go get a drink for old time's sake? Sure, I said. By now the animosity I held for the two of them was gone. Then I thought, this will be the last time I have to be with them. They can be alone together from now on. Let the swine live in their muck. They deserve each other. Ha, Jenna will have to get used to a lower standard of living. Okay, maybe the animosity wasn't gone. I may be a Polak, but I'm a respected one.